Over a decade ago, I met our guest today since we were both on the investment committee of the Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital. You were the property expert, so I observed you at work thinking, acting, and helping with their investment portfolio, and I was impressed by your sensible and thorough approach and investment flair. So, Hugh Llewellyn, welcome to the Money Means podcast. Thank you, Simon. Very good to be here. To twist the Monopoly board analogy, we advanced 10 years from that time at Great Ormond Street, and we're here in London, our offices in Marylebone, discussing your business and your new fund, the New Core Social Infrastructure Income Fund. But let's stay with the virtual Monopoly um, analogy and play the chance card, because I'd like to go back 10 years plus, and before that, as to why property even became your career destination. A well, good question. And it goes right back to when I was at Oxford and we were all leaving in 94 and everyone was working out what to do. And most of my friends and colleagues who were going into the investment world, which is where I wanted to go, were going into equities or bonds. It was early days for hedge funds and things then, but no one was going into real estate. And um, I thought, well, that seems like a good option then. If, the, if all these bright people are going into these other industries, I might have a better chance if I go into real estate. And it's proved a good decision and a, and a great career to have been in. And just fill in the gaps, uh, where did you learn your trade? Yeah, so I had to uh, go from Oxford uh, back into a world of sort of property basics through Reading University as an MSc. And then I actually qualified as a chartered surveyor. And then I quickly, having got those skills, went across to legal and general investment management on the, on the fund management side. I spent a bit of time at Hawk Point on the corporate finance side under a, a great man called Chris Nicole, who's sadly no longer with us, and then Aberdeen Asset Management. And then uh, in 2004, two colleagues and I from Aberdeen set up Protego, which was the predecessor business to Newcore. We sold that in 2010 to Bearings, and I worked for them for a year and a half or so, and then I got Newcore Capital going in 2011. Right. Very nice, concise history. Thank you. Now, it struck me the name Newcore was not accidental. What, what were you trying to signal? Uh, you were completely right. Back in 2009-10, looking at it through the real estate investment lens, most real estate investors targeted in those days offices, retail, and logistics or industrial property. But after the financial crisis, there was a emerging group of real estate sectors, which were, in my view, core to society, but new to the institutional mainstream. So areas linked to education, healthcare, transport, waste, living sectors like you know, residential and student housing. And they were being called alternative by the real estate market. And, but they weren't alternative. You were much more likely to go to a doctor's surgery or drop your children off at school or childcare than you were to spend some time in a secondary shopping center or hanging around on an industrial estate or something. And uh, so, um, hence, new core capital, core sectors new to the institutional mainstream. Okay, well, we're going to dive into a few of those so that investors potential investors as they understand you know your business get a full sort of grasp of it but essentially if we bring it down to the, you know the basics what do you do um, how do you do it and why does it matter so we are a real estate investment manager and that is our own everything we do involves us owning a property asset and then leasing it to a tenant we'll talk perhaps in a minute about what we mean by social infrastructure but all our tenants provide essential services and we own the property and collect rent from them. Now, we might buy a vacant property and improve it. And, and of course, there's a big drive at the moment to decarbonize buildings. So that's a big part of what we do. But in the essence, we uh, own the title to an asset, which we then get paid a priority income stream, i.e. the rent from our operating business. Now, whether that's a charity, a private company or government, um, differs in different cases, but it's it's very simple, really. And just give us a sense of assets that you manage. We're currently about 500 million under management. We've got some firepower for our value-add fund at the moment, um, which we raised last year from institutional investors. 
and and we're now out raising this new fund as well into this dislocated market. Okay, and we're going to talk about that marketplace and the and the, that dislocation and potentially the opportunity around it. But just give us a quick explanation of ownership of the company and the number of people you know you work with. Sure, we are seventeen strong. We are entirely management owned. I own fifty two percent of the business, but and when I started it, I owned one hundred percent of the business, but. I took the view much better to have a business with engaged, aligned partners. And when we were growing and small, it meant that we could attract some good talent who wanted to have a more entrepreneurial approach to the management of capital. And I've now got nine members of the team in the partnership. Three are treated as principal partners uh, in, in genuine partnership terms. The others are employees with a partnership stake in the business. Got it. So let's talk about social infrastructure and help me understand it? Sure. And it's a question we get asked a lot. In addressing this, if we go back to Great Ormond Street as a good analogy, there you have a hospital, which is the most amazing quaternary hospital, so the highest level of care that a clinical healthcare provider can provide. It requires incredible service and an incredible asset to enable that service to happen. And social infrastructure is always about an, ins- an essential service and the asset that enables that essential service to happen. So we- there is an example of clinical healthcare. We see that in education. We see that in waste management and the whole recycling and energy from waste and all that piece of it. We see it in transport. So where does society store its buses? Where, where do lorries get serviced? Where do we fill up our cars with petrol or now more increasingly EV charging? There's always a physical property asset that underpins those services. And together, the service and the asset make up social infrastructure. And there, th- th- this term sustainable income, which I know is applied to to what you're trying to do. Just help me understand that. The ownership of property and the rent that our tenants pay is obviously the key dynamic in what we do. If the tenants are paying a rent that is too high for the property, several things happen. First of all, the building as an investment doesn't perform because the rent stays flat or falls over time. Secondly, the tenant can't look after our building in in the way that it should from an environmental perspective. And thirdly, the tenant is having to charge much higher prices for the service that they're delivering because the rent's too high. So all of that creates an unsustainable metric. We as an investor are looking for assets where the rents are low and therefore eminently affordable. And therefore, even if our service provider of that essential service disappears because they were an over-leveraged private equity company or they were a charity that ran out of money, the service is still required and the next people can come and pay the same rent or higher rent to us so our investment isn't impaired as a result. That picks up a lot of things because a lot of people think of sustainability as just environmental or perhaps positive social impact, but they all come together in one ecosystem. Okay. Well, I'm going to come back to that sustainability and governance issue a little later on, but let's just stay with the business and its and its mission. In terms of your priorities on a month-to-month basis, what are the key three priorities? So we're a B corporation as a, as a business. Many people will understand what that means, but essentially it's an ethical business movement where you are trying to create a balanced framework across your business for all your stakeholders not just your shareholders. And you enshrine that in your uh, corporate documents, in our case, an LLP deed. And that means you are thinking actively about uh, not just your shareholders, but your employees, your workers, the communities you're working with, the environment, obviously your clients, highly important, and your suppliers as well, the people that provide legal audit, valuation, agency services to us. So my highest priority in running Nucor is about getting the right balance on a long-term basis of those different factors. And we've tried hard over the last 12 years since since I started the business up to do that, and we continue to do that. But it served us incredibly well because 
by having a long-term um, conservative approach to risk, we now sit in a very good position in the market um, looking into the future. So my, my objective is really boiled down into one, which is, which is ensuring we run a balanced, fair, rational business to deliver the objectives of our funds. And that then feeds a whole chain of other uh, stakeholders from the, what the capital is doing. Right. So returning to the underlying proposition, real estate, for the want of a better word, um, demand and supply. Let's start with the demand side of the equation. Can you give us a sense of the key demand drivers? Yeah. So the reason for investing in social infrastructure is that, as we've been discussing, it is always a service that requires a property asset to be delivered. You, it can't be deflated by the internet. It can be assisted by the internet. And we've seen how clinical healthcare is being aided by in internet solutions. But the principal primary uh, need is for a property to deliver that service. What happens as populations get older or grow, and indeed as society changes generally, is that the social infrastructure doesn't always keep up with the requirements of society. So you will get, for example, in a growing area, in a commuter belt, you'll get lots of houses coming through, perhaps some commercial workspace and things like that. But the social infrastructure often gets forgotten about. And if you're ever listening to you know, the Today program on Radio 4, whatever, the, the perennial questions are, oh, there isn't enough good quality educational space, there isn't enough quality clinical healthcare space, and it is underfunded as a theme, as a, as a whole use class, so that's very helpful from our perspective, because if we can own it and improve it and maintain it, uh, it's there for the long term. Uh, let's talk about the supply um, and how, how do you define that? We all know people have forever talked about property in the UK as being an asset class where the residential commercial people have liked. Um, there's this dislocation going on. So talk a little bit about supply. Yeah. So supply at the moment is being constrained by economic factors and by legacy fund management practices, I think I would describe. The, the UK is, is highly over leveraged as a real asset um, community. And it means that people have stopped developing and stopped refurbishing. Tenants are in some trouble because a lot of businesses have taken on too much debt as well. So we are in a contracting phase at the moment for it. And it's been well documented how Office markets have you know, halved in value probably in the UK. In reality, valuations are a little bit behind that. Retail for a long time, has that's been the case. Supply in those situations has essentially come through the internet. So this concept of virtual estate that you referred to earlier is there and it's, and it's the enemy of real estate because obviously if everyone can work from home and you reduce your office cost, that's a severely deflationary driver. Retail for a long time has been now driven through logistics and distribution channels more than the high street or shopping centers. So we want to only invest in assets where the supply is not deflated by the internet. We want to be in assets where demographics are another demand driver. And also, you've got a whole issue of the whole climate agenda, which is very important indeed, coming through, and assets that enable that. So storage related to renewable energy, um, changes to transport. So they are, are key factors at a macro level for us. Uh, we stick to the UK only as a business. That was a lesson for me learned from the Protego days where we were all across Europe, and it was much harder to deliver consistently good results back then. So UK only real estate linked to social infrastructure only. And as a result, we've, we've, we've achieved good returns and uh, on a sensible long-term basis. Just let's stay with that um, terminology that you've used and going through your documentation, it was, it's clearly important. You, you state that your objective is to invest in virtual resistant real estate. Now you're alluding to it, but I'd like just to flesh it out a little bit more so I can be sure that I, as long with other listeners, understand that. Yeah, virtual resistance, exactly. So why do the tenants need your property? Is it functional? Can they deliver the service more cheaply through another channel? We've seen that with retail 
the, the retailers quickly found that they could make more margins by um, selling online. It worked well for homogenous goods and logistics and, and industri industrial investment as a result did well off the back of it. But if you owned retail, that was not virtual resistant. That was absolutely right in the target sites of, of the internet. Working from home is another analogy to that. It's, it's, of course, these things go in cycles and working from home plus an economic recession or, or tough economic markets have been difficult for the office sector, but it's not virtual resistant. So virtual resistant means something you have to plant your two feet on to do, or it has to be there to enable what you are doing. How to, for society to function on a physical basis, you need that piece of real estate. And it's a very powerful and useful basis to an investment strategy if the need is there for the long term and you're skilled at managing the risk related to it. So that's ports, farms, the special educational need centres, hospitals. Absolutely, that's right. So if we look at our sectors, uh, education is a key uh, sector for us. So that is uh, assets like special educational needs schools, uh, childcare, some provision of private schooling, uh, university accommodation, very interesting. A lot of universities are uh, having to look carefully at how they're financing their obligations at the moment. And also they've got aging real estate. So teaming up with universities, we work with Bristol University, we work with Imperial about um, providing them with useful functional educational space, medical research space, graduate space. It's a really uh, enjoyable strategy to be part of because not only is it needed and therefore delivers a sensible risk-adjusted return, but actually you can point to this positive social impact of the, the university wouldn't have been able to refurbish that space without our capital or we would have had to do it in a different way. And we can therefore say we are contributing to a positive outcome in more than financial terms. So let's talk about the interest rate environment. We have gone from what some of us old timers would have considered a absurd free capital environment that the central banks stayed with too long and then have paid the price of having to adjust much more quickly, repricing with ramifications. You have been very conservative in your leverage as an operating business, but can you just explain a little bit about what the competitors have been up to since the great financial crisis and what you're seeing. Absolutely. The, since 2009 and 2010, th what should have happened in 2010 is that asset owners, fund managers and banks should have been punished for the excesses of the financial crisis. And in, including fund managers like Protego and all the rest of it, everyone who was leveraging, taking short-term bets, thinking that they were you know, the greatest um, thing since sliced bread. What actually happened was this pernicious quantitative easing. And worse than that, it continued to be used as a political and monetary tool right the way through the last decade, leading to very low interest rates, free money, as you say. That is, in my view, uh, an immoral concept. And it has led to some very difficult behaviors by fund management businesses. So when I set up Nucor, I, having gone through the financial crisis, I said to myself, I cannot conscionably run a fund management business managing institutional capital if I make the same mistakes that we made at Protego. And Protego wasn't a bad business, but it learned a lot from those timescales. And so I said, the first thing um, is that high leverage is just a gamble. You don't know when interest rates are going to change. I actually set up Nucor as a response to QE because I thought if QE had come in in 9 and 10 and 11, I thought, well, surely by 13, 14, it will start to unwind. That is likely to be inflationary. And therefore, what real assets can you own that have a chance of matching inflation as inflation comes back onto the book? Uh, and hence, social infrastructure being an interesting area to invest in. But of course, QE continued for another 10 years until Q4 22, and it compounded the issues that are with us now. And what we have at the moment is, is, a, is a deeply troubling situation, really, in my view, because 
not so much the high street lenders, although I think they are over leveraged themselves, but the whole shadow banking measures. And by that, I mean local authorities, central government, they are highly over leveraged and therefore not in a position to provide the services that they should. So that's the wider societal picture. Newcore for 12 years has run a very low leverage strategy, very conservative about what we own. We haven't been prepared to price our expected and required returns off a 1.5% guilt rate because that just wasn't reasonable. It had to be inflation plus a liquidity premium plus a property premium. So we've always wanted to get an 8 to 10% return from property investment. It meant that we only grew to three, four hundred million until last year, and then we and then we've received a lot of money on the back of a conservative and sensible strategy as a result of that. But it's taken twelve years, and just staying on the pitch over the twelve years has really been the challenge for the business. But now it is positive for us as a as a uh, component of the fund management market that we are now in a position where we haven't got legacy assets. We're not trying to deal with banks. And also we own assets which people still need regard because they can't do them on the internet. Yeah, I was actually reading last night Howard Marks, the great the great Howard Marks' uh, January piece, which is a, I think is more, it's quite widely available, but he used the term malinvestments, which are the product of that super cheap capital. I don't want to be overly moral about that, but we've got we've had a repricing, that causes dislocation, you've been conservative, that's creating opportunity. As I read your materials. I just thought to myself, would you really describe yourself as an infrastructure group or a real estate group? Or, and actually, does it even matter? That's a really good question. And institutional investors ask us that a lot because they often have buckets for infrastructure and, and buckets for real estate. I've, I've thought about this a lot and I've written extensively about it as well. For me, the ways that you can take long-term investment exposure and your uh, listeners, and you'll know this as well, is you can own shares in a company, you can own title to an asset, or you can have a contract lending money to one of those two. So you can have debt, real estate, or operating equity. In the past, social infrastructure has predominantly been accessed by institutional investors through the operating equity of businesses and funds owning those businesses. And that operating equity might be businesses that provide both the services and own their assets as well. And that is the case for economic infrastructure as well. Take a Thames Water or something like that. They provide a service, they own the underlying assets, and they run their balance sheet however they do. So I think in the next decade that the inflationary pressures and the cost of living sort of crunch that is going to affect all of the UK economy will make the operating equity more risky. There's obviously quite a lot of legacy, as you know, talk about those businesses that over leveraged their cash flows and are now and didn't invest in their in their infrastructure. So you can, if you're an institutional investor in infrastructure, you might have that might have been your route to doing it originally, but we provide a lower risk route, which probably has a better chance of providing income with inflationary growth than the operating equity now. And that, not in all cases, of course, but just on the basis that rent gets paid before dividends, our rental contracts have inflation linkage in them. And if we get our buildings right and the rent's right at the beginning, that building will keep doing that for the long term, regardless of if our tenant's the same or has been recapitalized or whatever. So what we're seeing, Simon, is, is, a, is a crossroads, really. We are of interest to real estate investors who want an alternative to offices and retail and logistics. And we are becoming increasingly of interest to infrastructure investors in the traditional parlance who are realizing that there are different ways of accessing the essential needs uh, and the cash flow of infrastructure. So it's exciting. And, and as you say, it doesn't really matter. Um, and we're happy to talk to institutional investors from both sides. And we have seen in our recent funds a growing incidence of that more traditional infrastructure capital looking more adroitly perhaps at, at the ongoing risks of, of infrastructure. So let's talk about the fund that you're in the process of raising. Um, it's, I believe, £375 million. Pounds. Um, could talk a little bit about structure, tax fees, objective. 
Sure. So it's an onshore UK exempt unit trust, so targeting pension funds. There will be some other feeders for uh, non-pension fund investors as well. And it's a long-term fund, so it has an open-ended structure, hence only for institutional investors. The retail market and, and open-ended funds do not compute, as, as we know. So, And obviously with sensible liquidity mechanisms over the medium term so that the manager can look after all investors for the long term. So onshore open-ended, we're raising initially 375 million of equity and, uh, and we'll put that to work on an unleveraged basis. The fund will be principally unlevered because again, you, if you start tangling with high leverage in an open-ended fund structure, that comes unstuck. And again, you only have to look back into 2023 and 22 to see the wreckage on the, on the shore there. We will be targeting within the fund um, in terms of the makeup, uh, approximately 20% in education, 20% in clinical healthcare, 20% in those areas, waste, waste to energy, the, those sort of the things enabling the new uh, economy and the new sort of climate driven economy, and 20% transport, so assets which enable um, society to get around. And then that's only 80%. So we do have some other interesting areas which are coming through veterinary mortuarial services and end-of-life care. We recently bought a mortuary. We're looking at crematoria. If you want virtual resistant real estate, <laughs> crematoria, perhaps the uh, best example of that. And then there are some emerging new core sectors that society needs to deal with its long-term issues. So protein close to cities. Obviously, fish farming at the moment is, uh, in my view, deeply environmentally unfriendly. And we need to find a solution to get fish farms close to cities. So onshore fish farming, very interesting. Um, touched um, before this discussion about space. We've been talking to uh, some very interesting spaceport operators who are enabling rockets to get up into space. And, and you control space, you control the world. There's much more savvy people than me know. But there is a property asset there that enables that service to happen. So the fund... 80% really are existing long-term themes that your listeners will be well, well conversant with. And then we're always thinking about where society is going in the future. And, and of course, because back in 2011, when I got the business going, education, clinical healthcare, waste management, they weren't considered you know, you know, investable asset classes. And now, 10 years later, they very much are. And that's why we've got the institutional demand. For them. Got it. So can you just give us an idea of your return objective yeah. and the fees? So the return objective is we're targeting a 9 to 11 per annum IRR. Um, we think that is something like 4 to 5% distributable income per year and then a, an inflationary increment. So should be attractive compared to fixed nominal gilts, which are now about 4% in the UK. And our fees are 1% per annum on NAV and it's a clean fee. There's nothing else. We actually do all our finance and administration in-house as well, so we don't have lots of add-on fees uh, that you sometimes get. So trying to keep it simple and understandable. Now, lots of conversation at all sorts of levels about you know, ESG, which is morphing into a more um, helpful conversation now, I think, about you know, governance and, you know, and what we really mean. Just to explain a little bit about, um, you talked about being a B Corp, but just explain about how you interpret investing responsibly. I think at its most basic, it comes down to courtesy and common sense and a long-term approach. And I think there are a lot of words, sustainability, ESG, impact, that get bandied around quite often from a marketing perspective, but get dislocated from the reality. And, and the reality for me is that if you have a building that's needed by society, is functional for the long term because its environmental performance is not spewing out lots of carbon dioxide and the utilities are under control, and it's delivering a sensible financial return, that is a very good start to a sustainable strategy. However, you need to then overlay it with some other considerations because there are lots of people who tell me that their social housing assets are sustainable. But actually, if those social housing assets sit in a fund structure that is highly leveraged and that doesn't allow 
the fund therefore to use capex on the buildings to keep the buildings functional for those vulnerable users you're you're you've gone backwards you're starting to become hypocritical again if you go up the one more level to the manager of that fund of that asset if the manager is squirreling all its profits offshore and not paying tax due to HMRC the manager can bang on all it likes about providing hospitals and clinical healthcare educational space and all the rest of it but if it isn't paying its taxes due to HMRC which HMRC will decide how to spend on education and healthcare then again it is open to claims of hypocrisy and then there's one other thing which you know is is sort of a personal thing which i think is that as the principle of a fund management business again behaving in a way which reflects all those values is important as well and and you've got to get a balance because you don't want to be holier than thou or preaching as the sort of vicar or whatever but it's hard to genuinely believe in that architecture of sustainability unless you yourself do that so that's how i approach life I wanted to just understand, because you are one of many people operating in the real estate space, about sourcing these opportunities. Um, and I know that as I looked through your assets and you know, your current fund or the ones you're looking at, like a fuel depot in Cambridge, and, and I sort of paused on the Greater London Nursery portfolio. And you don't have to talk about that, but I'd like to understand how, how you source opportunities. Yeah, Absolutely. First thing is we are quite unusual in the UK market as focusing only on social infrastructure, real estate. So all the agents out there who we cultivate relationships with and get to know and become friends with are aware that that is our sector. If they see a deal in you know, in education or clinical healthcare or transport, whatever, those are come and talk to us about it because we'll probably be interested, and we'll certainly understand the dynamics of it. We'll probably know the tenant. Uh, so we'll we'll have some good understanding of whether we should own it or not. The so the agency market comes to us because there aren't that many competitors, which is helpful. Also, really helpful for us our tenant set, and as we discussed, our tenants go from the NHS, so government, through to private businesses, um, so schools businesses, waste management businesses, uh, through to charities. You know, quite a few SEN school businesses are run by charities. We've got to know them well over the last 12 years. We've done repeat business with lots of them. So often our tenants come to us and say, we want to buy this business. It's five SEN schools around the UK. We think it's got great potential. So you buy the property and we'll lease it off you at day one. So that's really great when you get that relationship going. And I think what we're going to start seeing now, and it hasn't quite happened yet, but it's coming, is a lot of those private equity businesses that own social infrastructure, who have over leveraged themselves, being in a forced position to de-lever through sale and leasebacks. And so I think we'll see quite a lot of supply coming on in the next two to three years of those sort of assets from either private equity and also, as we touched on at the beginning, local government as well. So local government is in a pickle. And how does it manage its cash flow? Well, it probably has to move on to a leasing relationship um, rather than an ownership relationship to get short-term cash flow in. Rightly or wrongly, the, you know, but that is, a, that is a, a factual situation. And I think, again, going back to being a B corporation, it helps and having this holistic view to sustainability with counterparties like the NHS, like local government, like charity, it's, it has helped us a huge amount uh, as a business sourcing deals because our counterparties, our tenants, like working with us because they like the way that we do business. So talking about the clients, as in the people who will inv- have invested and will invest, can we just talk a little bit about... Um, what are the characteristics of a client for whom this strategy makes the most sense? Absolutely. So the the, the fund that we're marketing at the moment, and hopefully um, we should be in, at the first close in the first half of this year, got very good traction at the moment from a wide variety of investors. Institutional investors who traditionally would have been in offices and retail and are looking for an alternative to that. Infrastructure investors coming down the risk curve to try and keep 
achieving that steady income and, and inflationary linked capital growth. So, for example, the local government pension scheme is a big pot of money, um, generally super investors and counterparties for us, very nice people, long-term professional. So, that, so we have a lot of local government pension schemes, corporate pension schemes as well, and also insurance companies are in, in there also for us. Family offices with a long-term strategy. We're not great for a short-term tactical high levered bet as a, as a fund. That's not the strategy at all. So I've got three closing questions for you. Um, number one, what's the most important lesson you think you've learned from mistakes made over the past two decades? Well, there have been quite a lot of them. <laughs> so, uh, they, where does the list start? I think the first thing is to remember to stick to the basics of what you're good at. In the, in the course of Nucor's 12 years, we've only lost money on two assets. And we lost money on those two assets because we took operating risk. They were both care homes, actually. And instead of just owning the property and leasing them to an operator, we thought we could put in a manager and run it. And that didn't work out. As we are property investors. Stick to that. Understand the services our customers, our tenants provide, but and really know where they want to be and what sort of property they need. But we shouldn't be trying to, you know, cut people up, bury them, educate them, you know, charge their car with EV. Let, we'll just own the property. So the best learning is stick to the knitting. The second learning is that there's a lot of luck in timing of capital raising, having capital when others don't. And the day you start thinking that you are some, you know, amazing fund manager, and it's not about luck or timing or people liking you for some reason you didn't even know about, that is the day you should stop and do something very basic so that you don't touch other people's money. So I hope I can keep that attitude. And luckily, my partners in the business are forthright, and uh, there's no danger of them sort of... Uh, blowing uh, my uh, ego up. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was interesting as I was doing this research, I came across a recent report by a gentleman called Fergus Hicks. He's the real estate strategist at UBS Asset Management. And he said prices in Europe and the UK were correcting faster and we expect the UK market to bottom out first. So there's clearly been, there is this repricing dislocation, all the stuff. So, you know, from a timing standpoint, having capital to deploy seems, it seems propitious um, in terms of your timing. Just Talk to me about how you will define success five years hence. Yeah. So just touching on the timing of the market, we are in a dislocated market at the moment, but real estate is an inelastic asset class. So it always takes longer for the pressures of capital and cash flow requirements to come through. We're just starting to see it. We had a busy year last year uh, investing into that market. But I think um, over the next two years we'll see the real bottom of the market. And if you were an analogous to 2000, after the great financial crisis, I think we are in 2009 at the moment, but 10, 11, and 12 were very good years to be a real estate investor coming into the bottom. And there's no point, as we all know, trying to time the very bottom. You've just got to be ready and make sensible decisions. Which I'm now going to ask you an extra question, which is that if you were raising that money in the window that you described, how long would you expect to take to deploy it? About two years, I okay. think. Yeah, our velocity is about 150, 200 million a year, something like that. Uh, and, that's, and that's because one wants to sift out a lot of deals that aren't suitable and just do the ones that are. And so going back to my um, monopoly analogy, you've hinted at it, but, but what would be the two most valuable pieces on your new core monopoly board? You kindly uh, gave me notice of this question, Simon, <laughs> and I went and looked at the Monopoly board, and I and I thought, I looking at that, thinking, God, I like, I don't understand Mayfair and Park Lane, these sort of trophy assets that uh, that seem to levitate, and and uh, no doubt there are people who are expert in that. So that is not us. And then I thought, well, let's have a look on the board at the infrastructure, and you've got the utilities and the electricity companies. And without just sort of criticizing the strategy of those operating economic infrastructure businesses, they have got some issues, as we know. So then I'm going, well, how about the railway stations? Very interesting. So my first pick, please, all the railway stations and the nice land and car parking and ancillary land around those. And the second 
pick. I'm not sure if it is allowed, but the jail. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, unfortunately, society needs prisons. The principal um, uh, focus of, of, of uh, justice in this country is about locking people up. So they're going to be needed for the long term. The property asset leased to the um, government or the suppliers of that. It's a gritty sector like mortuaries, but it is it is highly needed by society. So I'm not, am, am I allowed that as an answer? Yes, you are absolutely. <laughs> and if it's sober or sombering, you know there are so, you know this is what you have decided is your core focus and what you are concentrating on. So I'm just going to summarize as I do in these situations. Um, I am not a property expert by any means, but in trying to sort of lift the bonnet and understand your business, I guess what I've taken away is that sticking to the basics is super important and you are UK only. You are, I think, rightly critical of the leverage that's been deployed and you have made very, very attractive returns, you know, without that leverage and your plan is to be conservative, you know, going forward. And that whatever one's excitement about those glamorous places on the Monopoly board, the reality is for those of us who have taken children to nurseries and schools and hospitals and, you know, and and the rest of it and... Uh, and I've unfortunately had to be at a couple of crematoria in the last in the last two years. Is that these are essential um, services and offering assets and offering return potential. So I think what you do is very differentiated, and it seems to me that it's uh, you know it's very appropriate for the environment. So Hugo, it's been great having you here today. Thank you, Simon. Thanks for having me. <laughs>